This is a quick E triple P review of abnormal psychology, particularly the DSM-5. This is meant to simply convey the very key terms in each category as a very quick overview. On the E triple P, you really need to be thinking about what something has to do with the prognosis of the disorder. So here's an overview of the DSM-4 changes to the DSM-5. The DSM used to be based on expert opinion and it has now moved to being more about research. Therefore, it is an empirically based document. Problems they found with DSMs in the past was that um, there were statistically significant differences that you found around lines of race, ethnicity. So the DSM-5 is our new manual, and the biggest change is that we're done with the multi-axis. There's no more not otherwise specified. There's more of an emphasis on culture, and it's polythetic. So polythetic means that there will be a subset of the criteria to meet and it's categorical so you either meet the diagnosis or not versus a continuum where you could say um, versus a continuum. So the changes in philosophy, one of the biggest things is that it's become much more of a cultural um, cult, uh, document that emphasizes culture. The chapters have also be re been reorganized and that is both to group them more about etiology, and now you don't have a section on kid disorders since many of them progress even into adulthood. So we're going to do a lot of review of the change up here at the beginning of this presentation of what was on the 4 to the 5, because at this point it's a big shift for a lot of people. But you can see there were five axes. On um, Now instead of axis 1 and 2 with the mental disorders, you're just going to record diagnoses in terms of their order of importance. Um, again, and that includes medical disorders. Axis 4 becomes V, Z, and T codes or other conditions, you know, from the other conditions. And finally, we're not using the global assessment of functioning. It was found to be just too subjective. But we are kind of um, matching up with the medical field more by using the HUDAS if you want to, to kind of say the level of functioning. Um, so here is an example of a five-axis diagnosis having now been switched to five, and you can see it's just a list of different things in order of importance. So the change to not otherwise specified, um, it was found that that just didn't have much meaning and people used it a lot. So now it's either other specified or unspecified, and this allows you to document exactly why the client doesn't meet the criteria, so you could say that the hypomanic episode lasted three days. So it could be um, a little different. So the major change, and some other major changes, so you have, in addition to V codes, T and Z codes, there's a big change in terms of Asperger's, autism, and pervasive developmental disorders. They've been consolidate, consolidated now into autism spectrum no five axis, and then the really big thing is that we're sort of not being off on our own as much and we're using ICD codes. Um, now, since we're not using the GAF, you can also, with different disorders, often indicate the level of severity. So when you, make, when you specify things, you'll add specifiers like level of severity. So what's positive about this? Um, it's more, it's overall, there's just a greater consideration of culture, etiology, and biological research. And furthermore, um, there's a little bit more of a lifespan model. The three major sections of the DSM-5 are the introduction, and then you have your diagnostic criteria and codes, and then in the third section, you'll have... Um, some assessment measures you can use, as well as the typical conditions for further study section. Um, 
Unfortunately, we just switched to ICD-9 and then we're going to ICD-10 and soon ICD-11 is coming out. So that's something to look forward to. So when you're coding, here are some examples of ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes. They're a little bit different. And here's another example of coding. ICD-11 is set to come out in 2015. Okay, so what about the cultural formulation interview? So as we move into greater consideration of culture, the DSM-5 has provided a semi-structured interview that has 16 questions designed to obtain information on views regarding social cultural context that they live in. Um, the outline when you actually make your cultural formulation will be four things. One, their identi the cultural identity. Two, cultural conceptualization of distress. Three, psychosocial stressors and cultural factors that impact their vulnerability and resilience. And four, cultural factors relevant to the therapist's relationship. There's also controversy over the DSM-5. The National Institute of Mental Health and the Department of Mental Health in California came out um, upset about, I guess not upset, but stating that they had issues with the DSM-5. The Brits as well from the Psychological Society um, said that we're inventing things and we are cre have created a document that will lead to over-medication. So we'll just have to see what future editions will be, but now instead of having the DSM-4-TR, note that we use the number now and that it will be 5.1, 5.2. Okay, so let's head into more about the diagnoses. So the DSM-5, let's highlight some of the changes in the DSM-5. Okay, first of all, in terms of diagnoses, there are no more kid disorders. They're now called neurodevelopmental disorders since many of these have a lifespan element. Um, if there's onset later than 17, um, then you, if there's a subtle difference, instead of six, you need five symptoms. A test-taking tip, ADHD is one of the most inquired diagnoses. Disruptive mood dis regulation disorder is a new one, and part of this was to stop diagnosing so many kids with bipolar 1. And the thing to remember about this is this is only for kids. This does not apply to adults, and it's persistent irritability every single day and recurrent temper outbursts almost daily. This one's had a lot of pushback, but Asperger's has been incorporated into Autistic Spectrum. This shouldn't be too much on the test, but we'll see since it's a new version. Schizotypal is now listed in two different places in the disorder, both in the personality disorders and in schizophrenia. There's a high concordance rate between schizotypal disorder and schizophrenia um, within families. And what about the personality disorders? Well, they considered changing personality disorders into um, sort of a trait domain model, but they have not done that, and you'll see it's in future considerations now. Delusional disorder has a big change. In the DSM-4, you're required to have a bizarre delusion, and now um, that's not a requirement anymore, but you can specify if it is bizarre. Additionally, OCD is no longer grouped as an anxiety disorder. This is based on research and they've added different ones to these OCD-ish disorders like hoarding, uh, hair pulling, and skin picking. PTSD is a trauma-related disorder and sexual abuse is now accounted for. It was not before. So those are the new, some of the most important changes and diagnoses in the DSM-5. Let's move into our different categories of diagnosis. So there are 19 different sections in the classification of mental disorders, starting with neurodevelopmental. Um, some key concepts as we go into this is um, what to do with diagnostic uncertainty and this piece about culture that we've talked about. So diagnostic uncertainty. Um, you can say other specified, which is indicate the reason it doesn't meet, unspecified, you don't want to give the reason, and provisional, that you just don't have enough information. The HUDAS um, can uh, match up with other 
other practitioners. Um, and there's also personality inventories included. The HUDAS is the World Health Disability Assessment Schedule, and you can actually self-administer this. Um, and it covers cognition, mobility, self-care, socialization, life activities, and participation. So what are some things to consider when you assess, when you do your initial assessments with clients? Well, um, consider the whole developmental course of both the disorder and the person, from prenatal environment to infant development, and trace the course of the illness. This will also include thinking about genetic issues and the history in the family of medical and mental illness issues. And finally, again, assess for culture. Um, the identity, conceptualization of distress, psychosocial stressors, and the relationship between client and therapist are all important to look at. Cultural conceptions of distress. A cultural syndrome is a cluster of symptoms that co-occur among individuals in a particular culture. A cultural idiom of distress is a different way of expressing distress. And cultural explanations are explanatory models for the causes of illness. So let's move deeper and deeper into the actual diagnoses now, and we'll start by talking about the neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, this connects to the bio chapter because these are really about early development. It can even have a lot of impact in terms of prenatal development. They typically manifest early, often before the kid enters grade school and are characterized by development that produce impairments, personal, social, academic, or occupational functioning. Um, there's a number of disorders included in this category. Starting with intellectual disability, um, the diagnostic criteria includes deficits in intellectual functioning, deficits in adaptive functioning, and the onset during develop that it needs to have an onset during the developmental period. Um, they do not call it mental retardation anymore because of the stigma that became, a set, uh, became connected with that. But you do need to include a specifier in terms of the severity. So when you think about intellectual disability, you want to think about two things, deficits in cognition and deficits in adaptive functioning. So one, cognition, two, functioning. Second thing, and this might be important on the test, is to understand the crucialness of the difference between mild and moderate intellectual disability. Mild is similar to functioning of a sixth grader, and they may be able to hold a job and be independent. Moderate is equivalent to a second grader, and the prognosis is not good. They will probably never be fully independent, so it's a world of difference for parents and for kids what diagnosis they get here. In terms of the etiology of intellectual disabilities, the number one cause would be chromosomal um, causes in terms of known causes, but really a third of these cases are not known what caused them. Moving into communications disorders. Communication disorders involve not understanding or being able to respond and have social issues. There are four primary communication disorders, language, speech, sound, child onset um, fluency, and social communication. The communication disorder most important to know about for the test is childhood onset fluency, which is really the same as stuttering. Time patterning of speech is inappropriate for the person's age. About 65 to 85% of kids recover, the severity of their disfluency at age 8 is the good predictor of their prognosis. The treatment, the best treatment for young children is to reduce psychological stress at home. Don't reprimand the child when they stutter and reduce demands on them. Additionally, habit reversal training has been found to be effective. 
Um, kids are, are taught to do, in adults, deep diaphragmatic breathing. Okay, moving into autism, which, as we know, has been one of the controversial changes from the DSM-4 to DSM-5. Autism combines all of the diagnoses from pervasive developmental disorders. What's the key? Here's the key and to remember. You have, need deficits in two core domains. So when you think autism, think deficits in two core domains. And those two domains are the social and the repetitive. The prevalence of this is on the rise, and this disorder you'll find is more common in boys than girls. Understanding autism in the brain, um, it's been linked to unusually rapid head growth during the first year of life and structural brain abnormalities, particularly in the amygdala and cerebellum. Serotonin, dopamine, and other neurotransmitter abnormalities are present. Um, so here's the shift from pervasive developmental. And you can see autism has actually gotten rid now. Um, RETS is not a diagnosis in the DSM anymore. This was the DSM-4. And so now, why did they change this? They were seeking to improve accuracy of diagnosing and the ability to describe specific symptoms. There, in some ways, are actually not very significant changes. So more on the two different domains of autism spectrum. The social communication has to be across multiple contexts. And it's there's not an ability to be reciprocal in the social-emotional interactions and nonverbal relationships are hard to understand. In terms of restrictive repetitive, what that means is it's, it's about behavior, it's about interests, it's about activities, and you need to have two of the following. So you, we've got stereotype movement, use of objects or speech. There needs to be things that are, have to be the same. It can be inflexible, adherence to routines. Um, so here are some of the details of Part A in terms of social deficits. In terms of restricted repetitive patterns of movement, you need to have at least two. And then what else? Third, it has to be early development. Fourth, it has to cause impairment. And five, it can't be because of intellectual disability. There are specifiers for autism, um, and because things coexist, you can say whether it has catatonia or other such things with it. And now what are the three levels? So this is another thing that's important to remember about autism. There's requiring support, substantial, and very substantial, so three different levels. And the focus now is on the history of the disorder. So in the past, there were three factors that they focused on with autism. So just knowing now that two is enough. And now we can specify and modify. What are the implications here? Um, hopefully better screening, screening and better services. The concerns are is that it's too stringent and that some kids with Asperger's won't get the support they need now that they don't qualify for the diagnosis, which also means they don't get the payment from insurance companies. So how do you treat autism? Um, the number one things recommended are shaping and discrimination training as well as applied behavior analysis. So applied behavioral analysis, you can see, is listed number one, and um, that can be very useful. Structure and naturalistic. Applied behavior analysis, 
is has multiple components, um, and it requires a lot of coaching for these kids. So where do people find support? Um, there's great online forums um, in mental health, but a lot of private practitioners actually specialize in this. Always important on the APPP is what the prognosis of disorders are. So it's important to know that the later the onset, the more able to communicate by five and the higher the IQ above 70, which is often the cutoff for intellectual disability, um, means a better prognosis. Moving into ADHD. Primary categories are inattention and hyperactivity impulsivity. Here are some requirements, the diagnostic criteria. The onset is prior to age 12. There need to be six symptoms of either inattention and or hyperactivity and it needs to be present in two settings. That Those are the three essential things. Six symptoms, onset prior to 12, present in two settings. So in terms of the prevalence, it's about 5% for kids and 25 for adults, often more prevalent for males than females. Here's the prognosis, always important to, t to note. 65 to 80 percent of kids with ADHD continue to meet the diagnostic criteria in adolescence. Um, 60 percent, 15 percent as young adults though, and 60 percent are in partial remission. Adults tend to have more of the inattention symptoms. And here's more on the exact wording in terms of the revisions. Um, there are often a lot of comorbid things, and ADHD and autism have been linked together. Um, one, one other thing to note about ADHD is that in terms of treatment, CNS stimulants help in 75% of cases. The National Institute of Mental Health did research that found that medication alone, medication and, and therapy were better than just therapy. Specific learning disorders. So what to know about specific learning disorders. It's been changed and it's coded with different specifiers. What is a specific learning disorder? Well, one symptom has to persist from this list of for at least six months. And here's the thing, academic skills lower than expected. It interferes with functioning at school and it began during school age. So there's three types, um, reading, writing, math, you know, and there's three different levels as well. Some of the disorders that were moved from childhood um, and resorted. Elimination now has its own section. Okay, in terms of the motor and tic disorders, these are ones where there are sudden, rapid, non-rhythmic motor movements. Tourette's disorder is the one that we've all heard of, and here's the criteria. One vocal tick and multiple motor tics needs to have lasted more than a year and began prior to 18. This tends to decline over time, but to treat it, antipsychotics like haloperidol are helpful in 80% of cases. Um, you can give a provisional diagnosis of less than a year. Comprehensive behavioral Therapy has been also shown, or treatment has been shown to be effective, and that includes habit reversal, relaxation, and psychoed. Behavioral pediatrics is the branch of medicine that's concerned with the psychological aspects of kids and that deal with illness. This can help with medica medication compliance and coping with medical procedures. These kids have been shown to be at increased risk um, for, for emotional and behavioral problems. And being hospitalized from the ages of one to four has been shown to have the most negative reaction. Chronic conditions lead to problems at school and chemotherapy can cause cognitive and learning difficulties.
With adolescents in particular, you'll see problems with compliance um, because, you know, at this time of their lives, there's more, you know, less conformity, more independence from parents and kind of wanting to break, th break free. For medical procedures, the stress in inoculation model of Mike and Baum has been used to help them. So reinforcement, breathing, etc. Okay, now moving into the schizophrenia section. So we're moving into the section on schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. There are different components of any of these disorders in the psychotic category. Important to know about negative versus positive, and that there's also just abnormal behavior and thinking. So we'll start with delusional disorder. Um, big change from the DSM-5 is that it does not have to um, have bizarre, anything bizarre at this point. But let's talk about what a delusion actually is. It's a false belief that is firmly held despite what everyone else believes or existence to the contrary. So this is important to know the difference between delusion and delirium. You need to have one or more delusions for at least a month. Functioning cannot be too impaired. Um, it's just there's some maybe some functioning problems as a result but of the delusion itself. Um, and the t there are five different types. Schizophrenia. So we're going to talk about the diagnosis, prognosis, um, and other aspects of this. Um, the diagnosis. You need two active phase symptoms. What about the etiology, treatment, and course? So this has been very much linked to um, genetics, and one theory is that there's an elevated oversensitive um, response to dopamine. In terms of neurotransmitters, serotonin, glutamate, and GABA have recently been implicated. These are so these are different in terms of the positive and negative symptoms. Treatment often includes antipsychotics, almost always. Therapy can be CBT, social skills, um, and family therapy can be helpful here. It's been somewhat reorganized, but just to remember in terms of criteria, you need to have two symptoms from criteria A, and these are the active phase symptoms. Two symptoms, two active phase symptoms, at least one month, continuous signs for six months. Expressed emotion. So this was originally a theory that kind of has, uh, not it's not as strong as it used to be, um, that it was part of the cause. But what we do know now is in terms of treatment, family interventions that target expressed emotion and criticizing and all of that kind of stuff, well, lower relapse, particularly for psychotic episodes. And what about the statistics on schizophrenia? Well, we know this is a genetically linked disorder, and um, you'll find that with bio siblings and fraternal twins, it's about 1 in 10, 10 and 17%. For identical twins, it's now 1 in 2, so about 50%. And for both parents, it's also about 50%. There are different schizophrenia spectrum disorders, but one thing to remember also about schizophrenia before we move on is that the pro prognosis is worse if there's a long prodromal phase and um, better with late onset, good premorbid functioning, women with insight and no family um, tend to do better. I don't know about the no family, but women and insight. So schizophreniform disorder is identical to schizophrenia. Okay, so it's identical, but it has a different time period. It's one to six months, and impairment is not required. Two-thirds of these people will eventually meet the full criteria for schizophrenia. Major depression with psychotic features has to be distinguished, and here's the difference. 
with schizoaffective disorder, which um, we'll talk maybe not more about, there has to be two weeks where the patient doesn't exhibit mood signs but has psychotic symptoms. That's the difference. So brief psychotic disorder. Here, um, whereas with schizophreniform, you have one to six months. Here, you're stepping it down and saying one day to one month. And you just need one, one psychotic symptom to qualify. These folks normally return fully to, premor um, to their premorbid functioning. And this is usually after exposure to an overwhelming stressor. Catatonia is now a specifier, and you can use it for the mood and psychotic disorders. Now we're moving into the bipolar and related disorders. The DSM has changed its layout for mood disorders. The building blocks of mood disorders are mood episodes, so we'll talk about the different mood episodes and then understand that from there, you build the disorders. What is a mood episode? It, um, it's a marked change in, norm, in the norm. So manic. This is essential to know. There's three main components, um, self-esteem, motor activity, and speech. So and you can see that with mania, you need to meet mortgage for five criteria total on random and three of the following. They go out impulsively gambling. They um, impulsively have sexual activity. In terms of time, remember, people, there's a minimum of a week. So a minimum very, of very, very one week. very, very high-risk behaviors. Just take off and go to Hawaii tomorrow and say, forget school, forget work. I don't care. It'll be fine. They leave for four weeks, spend all their money, come back. They don't have a job. Not good. So what happens with mania is you had to have, or the person had to have the symptoms for at least a week. This was severe. Usually this person would be hospitalized prior to one week because the symptoms were so severe. There have been cases where people have gotten on tie or high tall buildings with capes thinking that they would be able to fly. So very, very manic symptoms, very scary. And so in order to be a manic episode had to last at least a week. So those were the two. Now we looked at so <clears throat> can't sleep speech fast, racing thoughts, things aren't fitting together, not doing crazy things, having lots of sex with lots of random people. So hypomania is basically the kind of like step down from mania. So mood disorders, differential diagnoses. With hypomania, just know that there, it has to be egodystonic. Um, finally, another building block is the depression piece. A major depressive episode has to meet the following criteria. Um, most important to remember is time frame. So existed most of the day, nearly every day for two weeks. So think major depressive, two weeks. Major depressive, two weeks. So five symptoms, two weeks, impairment. So now we know the building blocks of mania, hypomania, Refresh and depressive disorder. Mania a week, ER hypomania four days, and depressive two weeks. I want you to weeks. remember how they classified bipolar. So when we were looking at mood disorders in dsm 4 TR, we would look at the four episodes, and that would tell us where we were going with a diagnosis. So for example, a major depressive episode you needed to look at depressive symptoms, but one of the big keys was anhedonia. Anhedonia meaning that it is, the person has lost pleasure in previous activities that they used to find pleasurable. And it's not just they got over it, but you can tell they don't want to go bowling and that's their favorite thing anymore. They don't want to play golf. They don't want to do a lot of the crafts that they used to do that made them happy. It's anhedonia. So we would look for that. Um, specific symptom. 
Now, the major depressive episode also had to, to include other depressive symptoms, but again, anhedonia is one that we would be looking for. Now, for a major depressive episode, the symptoms had to be present for at least two weeks. Major depressive episode, at least two weeks. Now, if you had at least two weeks of symptoms and therefore you met the criteria for major depressive episode, what did you have? Major depressive disorder, okay? Now, the second one was mania. So for mania, you had to have those. How do we um, code bipolar disorder? Um, code in terms of severity, psychosis, and remission status. Bipolar 1 is sort of the most serious of the two, and the, you don't actually have to have had a depressive episode ever. All you need is one manic um, client for one week, most of the day, nearly every day, and then there's three other three symptoms from the list. Making the bipolar 2 disor disorder, though, um, this you do have to have a major depressive episode and one hypomanic, no mania. As soon as there's mania, it's bipolar 1. One thing to note about bipolar 1 disorder is that there is 0.67 to 1 to one correlation with identical twins. So this is as kind of genetic as it can be, and only 20% with fraternal t twins. Um, there's other bipolar disorders so was a related combination to substance, of medical condition, or mania with going along with major depressive episode. So when you had those two going together, mania with the major depression, you only needed to meet criteria of those symptoms for one week. Why? Why not two? Because major depressive is two. Because mania trumped it. Mania trumped all of that. So, for example, if you had major depressive symptoms going on and the mania kicked in, it only needed to last for about a week or at least a week and then it would be a mixed episode, okay? Then the last is hypomania. So hypomania, your, your mark was four days. Hypomania on its own is nothing. And we'll talk about what the disorder is in a, in a minute. What it, what it did do is it looked at lower grade, mild or manic symptoms. So it's pretty much the same thing as mania, but milder. So for example, a person may go and overdraft a couple hundred bucks out of their account when they don't have it and go spend it on random things. Um, the person may have more of a sex drive, have a, a hyper sex drive, but it may be with the partner that they're with. So these energy like symptoms come about, but it's not serious like a manic episode so with hypomania the time cut off is four days so again major depressive episode two weeks a manic episode one week a mixed episode one week. and finally there's cyclothymia and with cyclothymia there's fluctuating hypomanic symptoms and numerous periods of depression but never do you meet the full criteria for either mania or major depressive episode. This has to be going on for two years in adults and one year in children and would be causing impairment. These mood issues have to be present for half the time. So what are some key diagnostic principles here? You need to ask, is the depression unipolar or bipolar? You need to look and see if there's different causes. And... Um, make sure you really look for hypomania in their history. So here is the index because you can see this is really about putting those building blocks together. So with bipolar 1, an example could mean you just have one person have a manic break. With persistent depressive, you could actually never have any of the hypomania. In terms of treatment of bipolar 1 and 2, with bipolar 1, 
lithium works 60 to 90 percent of the time. Um, CBT and family therapy, as well as interpersonal and social rhythm therapy, have been helpful. With bipolar 2, um, there's nothing in particular you need to remember. Okay, so let's talk more about the depressive disorders. All you need for a depressive disorder diagnosis is to have had at least one major depressive episode. There are a number of different depressive disorders, and we're going to start, um, after talking about etiology in general, talking about major depressive disorder. We're going to talk about depressive mood disorder etiology and treatment. Etiology, obviously biology and serotonin. And then CBT, two things to know about. First, Lewinson's behavioral model. He says there's a low rate of response contingent reinforcement of positive behavior, which leads to an extinction of positive behavior and leaves people with low self-esteem. That's Lewinson's behavioral theory. Secondly, know about learned helplessness. This is Seligman. He says that prior exposure to uncontrollable negative events led to people who attribute thing um, attribute things to being internal, stable, and global, so that there is hopelessness, and that is the big problem, is the hopelessness part. And finally, there's Beck's cognitive theory. We also have three-pronged theory here, and this is about cognition and self-statements, and that people are kind of illogically thinking about themselves, the world, and the future. With major depression, you'll see that women are twice as likely. In 12 months, the prevalence rate is 7%. The peak onset is in the mid-20s. The first episode is usually triggered by a stressor, but subsequent episodes don't aren't as much. Pseudo-dementia, you can differentiate from actual dementia because this is pseudo-dementia being depression, really, because there's an abrupt onset and the client is aware of the deficit and concerned about it. Depressogenic schemata is from Aaron Beck, and he, CBT has actually really evolved to incorporate the body. This disorder is diagnosed in the presence of one, recurrent temper outbursts, and two, persistently irritable mood. Needs to have been at least a year, and there need to be at least two settings that it happens in, not consistent with developmental age. Um, and these outbursts are raging. Um, there's aggression that's disproportionate, but it's really about being out of control, not like conduct disorder where there's an intent to harm. Um, there's no empirically supported treatments yet, and it is more common in males. Just a little bit more about major depressive disorder. Um, you need to know that you have ruled out other things, and there's always the grief issue. CBT theory. So we've already gone over Lewinson's behavioral theory. That's about response contingent reinforcement, being absent, low rate, um, learned helplessness, that it really just became about hopelessness is, is the big problem. Um... REM self-control model is important to know, and then Beck's cognitive, depressive cognitive triad. So make sure you look at um, depressive episode versus uncomplicated bereavement. Here's a way of differentiating between grief and depression. Persistent depressive disorder. Um, here's all you need to know about that. There's been a decreased mood for most days for two years in adults and one year in children. There cannot have been, um, more than one month where they were symptom free. So when you diagnose major depressive disorder, make sure there's no, been no hypomania. Um, Make sure you specify severity and where they're at in the illness. And 
um, with persistent depressive disorder, just remember the, the um, one year for kids and two years for adults. Different levels of severity. And then in premenstrual disorder, there's a whole list of symptoms that can go on here. It is an amplified version of PMS, but indeed it is not the same thing. Um, with PMDD, remember that it needs to have been present in every cycle for a year. What's the difference between that and PMS? Um, it is it is truly it is truly a different disorder. There's rage, there's suicidal thinking, and there's a really marked difference between other times in the month. It's not an exacerbation of a different disorder. Um, okay, what about peripartum onset? For peripartum onset, it needs to be during or within four weeks, one month of having the baby. And just know 80% of women actually get the ba baby blues, but this does not actually meet the criteria for depression. Seasonal affective pattern, um, it means that they're in the winter when there's less sun, there's more depression. Um, it is associated with changes in melatonin, circadian rhythm, serotonergic, serotonergic dysfunction, and phototherapy is thought to help. One kind of interesting thing is that people tend to um, crave carbs. Okay, so here's our slide for a seasonal pattern. Um, and you can see it's a little, it has its own flavor from a major depressive episode, a typical one. So, suicide. Um need to know about assessing for suicide and different and that really has to do to do with knowing about risk factors. So what are signs of suicide risk? Most people um, who are thinking about killing themselves have made a previous attempt, 60 to 80 percent, and 80 percent will actually tell you. Um, that you have something to worry about. In terms of suicide, really important to know that it's actually hopelessness that is more predictive than the depression itself or severity itself. Okay, so what are the different um, kind of associations with suicide? 1991 to 2003, it was older than 65. And then 2004, they found, oh, nope, it's younger now, 25 to 64. And then finally in 2010, they saw a split between men and women, and women in middle age, 45 to 54, and men over 75. Gender, four times as many men kill themselves, um, but with women, two to three times make attempts. Whites are the most, but they're, this is devastating, but with Native Americans, the 15 to 34 year olds are two and a half times more likely than the national average. As you move from divorce, separated widow to single, you can see a difference. Um, single being those folks, the single ones being the most at risk, um, or divorce being the most at risk. Um, early warning signs, they start threatening self harm and preparing their wills, etc. This is most common with major depression and bipolar disorder. Anyone with these mood disorders is 15 to 20 times more likely. Um, and depression, with depression, it's within three months of starting to improve that suicide usually happens. It's not when they're at their worst. The biological correlates are low serotonin and 5-HIAA. Devastating with veterans, the amount of suicide. Then some um, some final thoughts is about treatment um, for depression. And CBT and SSRIs are kind of the number one. And just know TCAs are for classic depression. SSRIs are for moderate to severe. And MAOIs are for atypical or if they haven't responded to other things.
Moving into the anxiety and then now separate obsessive compulsive disorders, trauma, stress. So starting with anxiety disorders. Okay, so what is an anxiety disorder? These are the disorders that have to do with fear, worry, and it can impact the body. Um, there are physiological symptoms and emotional symptoms, um, important to remember. And what is the prevalence? It's pretty huge, and you can see about one in five Americans are impacted every year. There have been changes. Um, in the DSM-5, one, of course, being that OCD has been moved and panic attack is not a specifier anymore. Differential diagnosis. This is hard because of the overlap between anxiety and depression, which is huge. Okay, first one up is separation anxiety disorder. This is the first one we're talking about because it's most often associated with children, 4% of kids. And this is developmentally inappropriate kind of fear about separating from home and attachment group. They're afraid of being alone. They get physical symptoms. Um, and with kids, there's also often school refusal. Systematic desensitization is seen as um, a treatment. Know that this is what you need to know. For kids, it's a month that they have to show it. Kids, one month. Adults, six months. Separation anxiety disorder definition and prevalence, you can see much less common for adults. So four weeks for kids, six months for adults. For adults, the attachment figure could be a partner. It could even be um, their own child. Selective mutism is a new diagnosis, and this is seen as about being about anxiety. They might be they might uh, be nonverbal. It's usually under age five. Specific phobias. So, what's the diagnostic criteria here? Um, this is a fear of one or more situations that well, one particular, of course, that they might be exposed um, to an object or situation that causes them intense fear. They avoid, they either avoid it entirely or endure it with severe distress. It is not proportional um, to what it is. It's persistent and impairs them. So with specific phobia, this often develops after a traumatic event, not necessarily, maybe not even often. It typically lasts about six months or more. Treatment is exposure with response prevention, the best being if it's in vivo. The lifetime prevalence is um, 9 to 12%, and every time they're exposed, they might have a panic attack. 13 years is the average age of onset. Social anxiety disorder. Social anxiety disorder is a fear of one or more situations that where someone might be exposed to scrutiny. The fears show anxiety um, and negative evaluation. Social anxiety disorder is considered persistent, non-proportional, and there's a lot of avoidance here. There's a specifier you can use to say it's performance only. So yeah, there's been a specifier added. And what about treatment? Exposure with response prevention and also teaching social skills and cognitive restructuring. All right, panic disorder. First of all, um, just like with mood disorders, you have those building blocks of panic disorder, you have the building block of a panic attack. It has been unlinked from agoraphobia. So panic disorder um, 
the criteria is that there's recurrent unexpected panic attacks, and at least one attack is followed by one month of concern that it will return or maladaptive change in behavior as a result. It's unexpected. That's the essential piece. Um, panic disorder can be treated with CBT with exposure. This is persistent fear. There's physiological as aspects. There can be some expected, but um, unexpected is essential here. Panic attack can still be a specifier, even though there is now a panic disorder. Panic disorder is really when there's been one month of concern after an attack that it's going to keep happening. It's changing things for them, impairing them. What are the essential features of a panic attack? Um, there's physiological and emotional. People often end up going to the hospital thinking they're having a heart attack. All right, so talking a little bit about agoraphobia, which is a new disorder. Agoraphobia is a fear of two or more situations that are public, um, like waiting in line, crowds. They fear escape will be difficult and they might, that they will be embarrassed. They will avoid um, with a companion. They'll, I mean, they'll be a little better with a companion. The there's distress, impairment. It typically lasts at least six months. In vivo, exposure with response prevention has been shown to be helpful. Intensive is probably better than long-term. 33% of these people are restricted to home. The average age is 30 to 44. Generalized anxiety disorder. Um, this is very common. The symptoms, restless, fatigued, mind goes blank, they're irritable, they're tense, they have trouble sleeping. Um, what to remember, <clears throat> that it needs to be six months or more. Six months or more and constant. They must find it difficult to control and have three or more of the symptoms listed. The treatment is CBT or CBT and drugs, like SSRIs. Anxiety disorders can also be induced with substance use. Medical conditions can also contribute to issues with anxiety. There are particular features of anxiety disorders when they're due to medical conditions. It can parallel the course of the illness. So treating anxiety disorders, CBT, um, of course, and medication. And what are the implications for counselors of all of this? Well, it's quite prevalent. Um, so remembering CBT and relaxation as possibilities. So OCD has now been split off from the anxiety disorders, so we're moving into its own section. OCD is about recurrent obsessions and compulsions. The treatment is either um, SSRIs or tricyclics, and in terms of therapy, exposure with response prevention is thought to be important. Body dysmorphic disorder, um, really not being preoccupied and not seeing oneself accurately. Hoarding has also been added to the DSM now. Additionally, trichotillomania is refers to hair pulling. These people try to stop but are unable. And skin picking, which is definitely an OCD kind of thing. Compulsive urge. Um, like with generalized anxiety, um, Substance can induce OCD symptoms. Moving into this, trauma and stressor disorders. 
First is reactive attachment. What you need to know is that you need to have two plus symptoms from the list. The diagnostic criteria is that you have real inhibition and withdrawal and behavior toward caregivers. The onset is between nine months and five years. This is a childhood disorder. It does not, the kid does not respond to comfort and it must be due to extremely insufficient care. Disinhibited social engagement disorder um, is, can be quite troubling to actually witness. They are inappropriate and excessively familiar with strangers. And again, this is also due to insufficient care. PTSD has been changed now. Sexual so for PTSD, violence can be included. Um, criteria, criteria is exposure to, to actual or for threatened death, death injury violence. Um, we need to have one or more older intrusion six. symptoms. Here are the requirements. And um, that has exposure led to, to avoidance, act, exposure to arousal. Um, These are a traumatic event, well, which could be avoiding death, things and have physical serious injury or sexual violence. And there are different um, ways one to in two which years. that can happen. It can be directly, is it typical, can be witnessing or learning that it happens without to being close. Or finally, free. being exposed to the details um, repeatedly, except when it's through the media. Um, secondly, there needs to be presence of symptoms as a result, and at least one of them must be intrusion symptoms, and that would include recurrent and voluntary distressing memories of the event, um, dissociative reactions, intense or prolonged stress, psychological distress when reminded, and physiological reactions. Thirdly, there needs to be a persistent avoidance of stimuli that's associated with the event, and that can be evidenced by one or both of the following, either avoiding the memories, thoughts, feelings as internal things, or avoiding external reminders that will elicit the distressing memories, thoughts, and feelings. So first is exposure to a trauma, Two is presence of at least one kind of intrusive symptom. Third is persistent avoidance of associated stimuli. And then fourth, negative changes in cognition or mood are associated with the event. And that needs to be evidenced by at least two of the following. Inability to remember an important aspect. Persistent negative beliefs about oneself and others in the world. Persistent distorted cognitions related to the event's cause or co consequences. Markedly diminished interest in significant activities, feelings of detachment from others, and persistent inability to experience positive emotions. Six, and finally, there must be a marked change in arousal and reactivity associated with the event as evidenced by at least two of the following. Irritable behavior and angry outbursts, reckless or destructive reckless or destructive behavior, hypervigilance, exaggerated startle response, impaired concentration, and sleep disturbance. So two of those. So six things. One, exposure to the trauma. Two, presence of one intrusive symptom. Three, persistent avoidance of internal or external stimuli. Uh, four, negative changes in cognition or mood. And five, marked change in arousal levels. This is different for children under the age of six. You can also have the diagnosis of PTSD for children. This can include that you learned it happened to a caregiver, but this does not include TV. Acute stress disorder lasts three days to one month. Whereas for PTSD standardly, it is anything more than a month. So as soon as you hit the month line, you're moving into PTSD category. Nine symptoms following a trauma of five different categories, intrusion, negative mood, dissociation, avoidance, and arousal. Adjustment disorder has to have onset from some event within three months and must remit within six months. This is an emotional or behavioral response to a stressor, and it's just not proportional to what happened. Moving into the dissociative disorders, somatic, feeding, elimination, and sleep-wake. So, here are some key concepts. Things we'll go over. What are the dissociative disorders? Well, you have DID. Um, dissociative amnesia, depersonalization, derealization. Dissociative identity disorder is characterized by the existence in one individual of two or more distinct personality states. 
Dissociative amnesia. Um, this is a situation when you can't recall important personal information. It's about the person, and it's not forgetfulness. There's impairment, often related to exposure to trauma, and most commonly it is localized and selective, which means it's related to a certain time and related to a certain event. This disorder has persistent episodes of depersonalization, which is the sense of unreality and being an outsider of yourself, and derealization, which is a sense of unreality or detachment from surroundings. So self versus surroundings, but detachment. Reality testing is intact. There are also s disorders that are particularly related to somatic symptoms. The ones to know about um, in particular are conversion disorder and fictitious. Conversion is a disturbance in voluntary um, or sensory function, which leads to a really serious condition and it's incompatible with anything that is actually medically diagnosable. For fictitious disorder, this is a purposeful falsification of symptoms without a clear external reward versus malingering where there's, you know, some sort of external reward. Um, with fictitious disorder, it could be on the self or the other. So you can impose it on someone else and the therapeutic relationship is what's the only kind of thing to think about in terms of treatment because these people don't, don't tend to go unless they're court ordered or their family encourages them to. Feeding and eating disorders include anorexia and bulimia. PICA, of course, involves persistent of eating of non-nutritive, non-food substances. Anorexia, here's the three things to remember. One, restriction of intake is leading to a low BMI. Two, an intense fear of weight gain is there. Three, there's a disturbance in experience of body or at least a lack of insight into their, the seriousness of their low weight. The treatment um, at some point can be hospitalization with contingency management, depending on how severe it is, cognitive behavioral therapy, as well as Family therapy where the anorexic client or the client with anorexia is separate from the family. Bulimia, remember in terms of time, once a week for three months. So once a week for three months. Criteria are three, recurrent binges, compensatory behavior, and third, self-evaluation is unduly influenced by weight. The treatment is nutritional counseling and CBT, learning to distract oneself when you want to binge, and antidepressants can help, but the relapse rate is high there. Restrictive food intake disorder um, is the final one, and this is what it sounds like. Binge eating requires current, recurrent episodes of binge eating where there's a feeling of a lack of control and at least three symptoms of eating fast, getting too full, feeling embarrassed. It must be distressing and once, once a week for three months, just like with bulimia, once a week for three months. Elimination disorders are enuresis and encopresis. Enuresis is voiding of urine into the bed. Um, this needs to be, criteria is twice a week for three months. There are specifiers of nocturnal, diurnal, or both. Um, you need to be at least five years of age because otherwise it could just be part of development. The treatment is bell and pad, which is basically an alarm that wakes the person up, and that's found to be effective in 80% of cases. Additionally, imipramine can suppress it, but most people relapse because there hasn't actually been treatment. An antidiuretic can also be helpful for a short period of time. Encopresis is the involuntary or intentional passage of feces into inappropriate places. This as well, this has to be once um, a month for three months. So this can happen much less frequently and still be considered a disorder. Sleep-wake disorders. Um, we will just briefly talk about of these insomnia and narcolepsy, um, and also non-rapid eye movement. But ins um, insomnia disorder is just 
it requires somebody to be dissatisfied with the quality or quantity of their sleep. This needs to be three nights a week for three months. So three nights a week for three months, which is, you know, almost half the time you're struggling. One symptom, um, one, just one symptom of this, like initiating sleep, waking up too early, all of these things. Treatment incorporates strategies like sleep hygiene, education, and stimulus control. Hypersomnolence is excessive sleepiness despite sleeping enough. Narcolepsy, um, this is also three times a week for three months. There are like daytime naps or just lapsing into sleep accidentally. Um, it also requires the presence of cataplexy or REM latency, which is less than 15 minutes. Finally, non-rapid eye movement disorder. This is um, different than nightmare disorder. The essential features is that there's an incomplete awakening during the night, and it's the first third of the sleep episode. It can involve sleepwalking, sleep terrors, but the thing about this is that there's limited or no recall of it even happening. Whereas with night nightmare disorder, the dreams are very well remembered, and they're fully awake and afraid when they wake up. Okay, now we're moving into sex, gender, impulse, conduct, substance. Three different dysfunctions that we're going to talk about, erectile disorder, genitopelvic pain, and premature ejaculation. Starting with the male um, erectile disorder must have one of these three criteria. Can't maintain an erection during activity, can't um, maintain the erection until completion, and third, the, it decreases in rigidity almost all the time. Um, the treatment is first to have a medical evaluation to see if there's a cause behind it. Um, CBT therapy can help and Viagra increases blood flow to help Genitopelvic pain penetration, you have to have at least one of these symptoms for at least six months. Pain during penetration, anxiety about the pain, or tensing the pelvic floor during attempts at penetration. The treatment is seen as sex therapy. Premature ejaculation um, means that it has to happen within a minute or before the person desires it, and this has to be happening as well for over six months and almost all the time. This could be attributed in part to low levels of serotonin. Um, and both, um, this could be treated with the start, stop, or squeeze technique. So sex therapy can be helpful for genital pain and premature ejaculation. And of all of these three, just remember that um, six months is required, but maybe not for the erectile disorder. Gender dysphoria um, has to last six months or more. The diagnostic criteria is an incongruence between the assigned and experienced gender, um, that in particular for kids, and the desire to be the opposite sex. For kids, you need to have five plus symptoms, and for adolescents or adults, just two plus symptoms. Paraphilic disorders. These are intense and persistent sexual interests that might cause harm or distress to others. Um, that's one, one possibility for paraphilias. So yes, by definition it causes harm and with peeping toms that can be abusing rights. So we'll talk about frauderistic and transvestic. Frauderistic is arousal from rubbing against non-consenting adults, and it usually begins in adolescence and declines with age. The treatment is covert sensitization or orgasmic reconditioning in Depo Provera. So I'm a little confused because transvestic disorder, I think is also under trans um, paraphilic, but it's not causing harm to others. So um, I'm not sure why that is included. But anyway, it's cross-dressing for the purpose of arousal, and it's mostly heterosexual men. 
Okay, let's talk about oppositional defiant and conduct disorder. Oppositional defiant needs to be present for six months or more. And these are your kids that are just angry, vindictive, defiant. They're losing their temper and arguing with authority and just won't comply with rules. So they're, they're not necessarily easy to deal with. But conduct disorder is a whole other level. This is behavior that's violating the rights of others and really violating social norms in a s s significant way. They're, of the symptoms, they need to have three or more for conduct disorder to be diagnosed. Um, this involves hurting animals and people, destructing po property, lying and stealing, and just really serious rule violation. Um, one of the symptoms has to be in the past six months. So this is the, this can be, um, from Moffitt, two different causes or two different tracks. One is life course persistent, and this cause is seen as more neurological and beginning really early. And the second is adolescence limited. And this is more associated with a maturity gap between, um, you know, like independence and where they're at. So this is temporary and with peers. The treatment for conduct disorder, one is really to help the parents learn to reward positive behavior and not physically punish, but replace it with things like timeout, etc. And multisystemic therapy, which comes at things from a lot of angles. And that's because this is a pretty hard one to address. If you're over 18 and you meet the criteria for antisocial, you cannot meet the criteria for conduct disorder. Substance-related and addictive disorders. There has been a shift from the DSM-4 about how these are classified. So substance use disorders, um, with all of them, it needs to be a year over a year and have two symptoms. Um, exam questions are going to ask about relapse. So, first of all, the diagnostic criteria: you try to cut down, you can't. You crave the substance; it's causing problems in your life. It's you're even in physical dangerous, and when you try to stop, there's actual physical signs. So, this is a substance use disorder. Um, the four categories that it's really talking about is issues of control, social issue, issues, risky behaviors, and buildup of tolerance. So what about relapse, which is the essential piece here? There's Marlott and Gordon relapse prevention therapy, and this is really important because it's different than AA. It says, look, drinking is an overlearned maladaptive pattern, and relapse is, go is, is going to happen, you know, maybe it won't, but it, it makes sense that it would happen. And that's okay, because it's just a mistake. And it results from things that are external that you can control. Um, so you use CBT strategies then to prevent those, your, yourself from being in situations where those external factors will trigger it. Then talking about tobacco use disorder and smoking cessation. So People don't always want to quit because they're afraid of gaining weight, particularly with women. They're afraid of failing. And it's really hard to do. So things that are associated with people that are successful is, for example, men that are older than 35. Smoking cessation treatment. Um, this includes three different pieces, nicotine replacement, multi-component behavioral therapy, and clinician support. Um, there are a number of substance-related disorders. Caffeine cannot be a substance use disorder, though you can see it's on here in terms of a caffeine-related disorder. So here are some of the criteria and the symptoms. You can also, um, you can see the four different categories. They removed legal problems. So here are some of the changes. And gambling is now here because we're talking about abusive disorders. So alcohol and Korsakoff. So alcohol um, induced major cognitive neurocognitive disorder is another name for this. And you'll have interrograde and retrograde amnesia, confabulation, making up stories due to thiamine deficiency. And just note that alcohol interferes with creating memory. So this is more of a storage rather than a retrieval problem. So Marlart and alcohol prevent alcohol relapse, which we've talked about. The question on the test will be who is most likely to relapse. And you just want to know that um, 
those who are in the most distress and have the most negative moods, that those are the pieces that are going to kind of cue them. Um, since in the first place, it was an attempt to deal with anxiety. Important fact about smoking, 75% of those who try relapse within three months. Or two months, I'm sorry, two months. So we're mostly talking about withdrawal, but since cocaine might be on the test, just know that dilated pupils is one sign of intoxication. In terms of withdrawal, alcohol, um, within a few days of reducing alcohol, there will be agitation, hyperactivity, seizures, hallucinations, hand tremors, anxiety. For opioid withdrawal, you want to see three symptoms. of. You'll see three more symptoms after reduction dysphoria, and just think about the flu. It's like the flu, nausea, fever, muscle aches, sweating, diarrhea, insomnia. They also have dilated pupils. Then you can picture somebody who is going through tobacco withdrawal. All of a sudden, they're hungry again. Their appetite's not suppressed. They're irritable. They're anxious. They're distracted. They're sad. Okay, now we're going to talk about neurocognitive and personality disorders. You know about delirium, um, and then different aspects of, you can have major and mild, and then we can go into different versions. So, pseudodementia is actually not a neurocognitive disorder, but it's here to say this is depression elderly that can look like dementia but the onset is um, more abrupt and they're aware of it, the problem. So neurocognitive disorders, these involve deficits in cognitive functioning, and there are six domains. This is attention, executive function, like planning, learning and memory become a problem, language is actually part of it, the perceptual motor skills, and finally social cognition as well. How do you tell the difference between delirium and dementia? Delirium is abrupt, dementia is prolonged. So delirium requires two things. The first is a disturbance in awareness, and the second is a cognitive disturbance. So the disturbance in awareness can arise in a very short period, and then there's a lot of fluctuation. The cognitive distur disturbance means that there's memory, orientation, language, perceptual, visuospatial, that there's just this general confusion. And the treatment here is to um, figure out whatever it was causing it. So if it's withdrawal, you need to treat whatever the cause of the delirium is. But the way of kind of handling it in the moment is to reduce the agitation involved by um, a really caring environment and antipsychotics. So there are major and mild neurocognitive disorder, and this is about how severe it is. There's evidence of significant decline from functioning that interferes with independence um, and doesn't occur in the context of delirium for major cognitive disorder, neurocognitive disorder. For mild, um, there's modest decline in functioning, and they can still be independent, even if there's, they're compensating. The DSM-5 identifies 13 different types based on their etiology. We're going to talk a little bit more about um, three different kinds, the Alzheimer's, vascular, and HIV disease types. But there can be other causes like Huntington's, Parkinson's, traumatic brain injury, etc. So what does it look like with Alzheimer's disease? Here you have a really insidious onset of symptoms and a gradual progression. There's four, or not four, Bella is dreaming. <laughs> there are three stages here, um, starting from the first three years, the next 10 years, within the next 10 years, and then eight to 12 years. The first three years, the antero, hard to form new memories, um, and there's some visuospatial stuff and irritability. But as you get deeper into it, retrograde amnesia begins and the mood starts to flatten and there are language and kind of more, more problematic things. And then finally, once you get on the average about the 10 year mark, there is really severe deterioration that occurs to the point of incontinence and um, it, it, you know, really not functioning anymore. <clears throat> 
the gene there's a genetic component here. The early onset is associated with chromosomes 1, 14, and 21, but they, there is different chromosomal piece. Um, acetylcholine is the associated neurotransmitter, and the brain area is the medial temporal area. Um, in particular, the hippocampus and amygdala are impacted, as you can imagine, because of the emotional issues and the memory issues. Um, you can get this disorder if the criteria for Alzheimer's probable Alzheimer's has been met. In 60 to 90 percent of people um, with dementia actually have Alzheimer's disease, so it's the main cause. Vascular um, episodes can also cause neurocognitive problems. Uh, diagno diagnosis, there was a past cerebral vascular disease. With this, <clears throat> unlike Alzheimer's, which is insidious, insidious there is an acute onset. Well, there's three different ways. There's an acute onset where there's partial recovery, there's stepwise decline, and then there's progressive that, you know, it fluctuates in terms of how much concentration, memory, and psychomotor speed there is. Neurocognitive disorder due to HIV infection. Um, the HIV is the source of the problem and it causes subcortical area damage. There are considered to be six stages from zero to four end stage where you progress from normal to, um, to the point of vegetative and incontinent. Um, impairment of concentration, memory, there's depression and tremors here. To associate a fugue, this is just incredibly rare. Some people don't even believe it, but this is when you kind of travel places and don't remember. Psychological. Um, and finally, let's just a note on long-term memory since it relates to neurocognitive things. Procedure is what you know without knowing and declarative is that contra is conscious. And lastly, we'll talk about personality disorders. Three clusters. Cluster A are the odd and eccentric. Um, cluster B are the dramatic, emotional, and erratic. And cluster C is the anxious and fearful. The clusters were named by Milan, who um, I think did the MCMI. Um, the question is, how much of it do you have? Because everyone has aspects of these. So one thing to know about the personality disorders is they are, they have an interesting history and they're thinking about changing the way that they construct them. And the original draft was changed because it was so controversial, but it was eliminating disorders people found useful. But the research did not necessarily support um, that you could keep some of these disorders that we've been using for a long time. So the DSM-5, as much as there was gossip about it being different, it's actually the same. And the way it's organized um, is just the three clusters of A, B, and C. And the features in the disorders will talk about cognition, emotion, interpersonal, and impulse. There are 10 different personality disorders. The definition is that it's enduring. That's what's different about it. Um, it's stable and it's kind of built into the personality. It's pervasive. There are new culture-related diagnostic issues, um, like with schizotypal, voodoo, or antisocial is overdiagnosed with lower SES. So let's talk first about cluster A, which is the odd and eccentric behaviors. Essential to paranoid personality is that there's just this pervasive distrust and suspiciousness of people's motives. With schizoid, um, this isn't about distrust. This isn't about social deficits. It's just they don't really care. I mean, that's the thing. They're detached. There's a restricted range of emotional expression, and they don't really desire intimacy. If the test asks you what happens if you psychologically distrust them, it's nothing like major depression. It's um, They just withdraw. They aren't too bothered. Schizotypal. Um, this has to do with social deficits, eccentricities, and you can imagine that because it sounds like schizophrenic. 
and first cousins have a higher rate of schizophrenia. Cluster B are the dramatic ones. Um, starting with antisocial, this can be an evolution from conduct disorder. There are three main areas of symptoms about social norms. Um, well, you need to have three symptoms, and that is within nor social norms, deceitfulness, impulsiveness, recklessness, and just a lack of remorse. Um, there needs to be a sign of this disregard of other, the rights of others before age 15 um, and at least 18. Borderline, combination of CBT, or not combination, sorry, uh, borderline instability in relationships and self-image, affect, and impulsivity. So it's really about being unstable from ages of 19 to 34 is typically first diagnosis. And actually, 75% of people no longer meet the criteria by the time they're 40, so it seems to improve with age. DBT goes hand in hand, and that can be on the test, potentially. It's a combination of CBT and Rogers, and it says acceptance is necessary for change and is a multi-component therapy with group, outpatient, phone. Histrionic. Um, these are folks that are just very emotional and seeking of attention. Their relationships can be somewhat superficial. And with narcissistic personality, this begins in early adulthood, and there's a need for affirmation and a lack of empathy. Avoidant personality disorder. So unlike the schizotypal, um, or not schizotypal, unlike the schizoid folks who really are detached, avoidant are inhibited socially, but they feel inadequate and they're very sensitive. They want to be in contact, but they fear humiliation. And this is a very pervasive and enduring personality. Dependent personality, um, so we're in the anxiety fearfulness category now. These are folks who need to be taken care of. They're submissive and clinging and afraid of separation. And finally, OCPD. Basically, there's no obsessions and compulsions, um, but there is a preoccupation with order, perfection, control. So that ends up leading to really a lot of rigidity. Um, and it's hard to be flexible, open, and then that can impede efficiency. So what's next? Um, there are no changes yet in the personality disorders, so they would need to do more research, but people are frustrating. Um, well, people are frustrating and they're frustrated with this model. Um, the task force wants to move to a, wanted to move to a dimensional model. Um, so here are five domains of psychopathology and how the personality disorders would map onto it. ICD-11 is coming in 2015, and it's going to be a more radical approach that would abolish individual categories of personality disorder. So as we kind of transfer to ICD-11. Um, we'll see how the DSM um, changes in terms of how we use it. Um, here's an example of avoidant personality disorder diagnosis. Potentially, there could be new groupings. So in the DSM-5, moving on from personality disorders, you can see new groupings of disorders. And here's some um, ways that it could be grouped. Clustering diagnoses as well, according to internalizing and externalizing, is one possibility. And that is a basic overview of the DSM-5.